Greetings friends. Welcome again to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We continue to look here in our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And again we thank you for taking the time to watch our videos. And we pray that our studies in the Word of God might be a blessing to some. Of which we trust that they are. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Again we'll pick up here. Uh, let's pick up at verse 12. Verse 12, reading on through, we see that all, it says again, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought or bought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but, the, but for the Lord. And the Lord... For the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? And shall then uh, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is so, uh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not? that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now as we continue in this, and we were looking at verse 15 there last time, where again he said, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. Here again, speaking about the sins of the flesh, the sins which, as he spoke of it up there before, said we've all been partakers of sin one degree or another, one type or another. But yet we are now saved. We are now justified. We are now glorified. We are now children of God, striving to live according to the Word of God, to keep these things not for salvation, but that we might be found pleasing in His sight, that we might bring glory and honor unto Him, that others might see the grace of God and trust in Him even as we have, that God through us might show that light to the world, which is Christ. There is no other way, no other person but Him who can save us. What we do with these bodies matters as Christians, as followers of the Lord. And we ought not yield ourselves unto any form of sin or wickedness as best we are able to understand it. We might not, as a babe in Christ and someone who is newly saved, may not yet fully understand and know all things. But yet that spirit will guide us and it will prick our hearts, cause us to realize when we begin to think upon certain things and go in certain directions, he'll begin to, we'll feel it, we'll know it. But we ought not yield our bodies, our physical bodies, unto sin. We ought not be joined in a, un, uh, uh, in a union that he's speaking of here as fornication with a harlot with someone else when we're not married to them. That marriage and that holy union, even as he's speaking of there, that two shall be one flesh. In marriage, you become one. And that marriage, being a legal understanding under the law, by the power of God, when you're publicly married and decreed that you are one together, that you are hers and she is yours, and that together you become one in the eyes of God. There is that assurance that God saves. Hope that God can save and will save the spouse. Hope that God can and will save our children. 
but it is by the working of the power of God. And we ought not yield ourselves unto this wickedness. As he said, God forbid, God forbid that we would desire it. God forbid that we would dwell upon it and let it roll over our minds. God forbid that we would yield our bodies in to be a part of that wickedness. My friends, let me warn you. What you continue to dwell upon in your mind, you're more apt to do. We've heard an example of this before where one spoke of one who walked down the street and looked into a store window and saw something that he wanted. He lacked the physical, uh, he, he lacked the ability to purchase what he wanted. But every day he would walk by it and see it and think upon it. Oh, how he wanted that item. But yet, he still lacked the ability to raise and earn the money to possess it. Instead of going a different route, instead of just putting it out of his mind, he continued to go by it every day and, and think upon it until eventually he found himself one day actually breaking in and taking it. Wickedness. Sin. It starts in the mind. It begins with a thought. And we allow it to prevail. We allow it to abide. And eventually it does prevail then and will become an outward sin. We don't have to let the thoughts abide. We don't have to continue to dwell upon them. But we need to turn to the Word of God and let the thoughts of what God's Word tells us to abide in our mind and our heart. Let it be a light on our path, lest we yield ourselves into some form of wickedness. Whether it be even in that story of one who became a thief, whether it be gluttony, or whether it be fornication and immoral actions. But we ought not yield ourselves unto these wicked and ungodly things. And so what, verse 16, What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Again, that covenant of marriage, where two come together and they become one flesh, and that union of theirs is honored of God in marriage, the bed is undefiled. Outside of marriage, it's sin, it's wickedness, it's fornication, when it's between two that are not married to anyone. But when one of those persons is married and then takes part in a union with someone that is not their spouse, it becomes adultery. It's an even worse sin of immoral action. But we ought not yield ourselves to these things. We ought not dwell upon these things. We ought not let ourselves be in a situation to where we can be tempted, where we might yield ourselves unto these things. We need to flee it. We need to flee it. But to be joined together under the law and teaching of God is to become one in the eyes of God. Not that, and fornication is not marriage. Two come together in fornication, that's not marriage. No, no, not at all. Do not bring marriage down to that level, to where it is so defined. Marriage is that holy union of where two are brought together, and you don't have to be married in a so-called church way. It's traditional, most do it that way. But you can go before any justice of the peace, any... Uh, Proficiator of the law, any that are observers and keepers of the law, and thereby before that judge be lawfully and legally married and become one together as husband and wife and glorify God. It's a public ceremony which declares and shows forth that you are legally bound together and you are now a husband and wife. And you have a responsibility then to each other to keep yourselves for each other and to glorify God therein. And as he says in verse 17, But he that is joined to the Lord, or joined unto the Lord, is one spirit. Just as when two come together and their bodies are joined together and they become one flesh, we as Christians, as saved people, we are joined with the Lord and we have one spirit. Our spirit is with his, or that is, his spirit dwelling within us, that Holy Spirit, and Christ with it, in and through that Holy Spirit. Our connection, the Holy Spirit connects us to the Lord, which also connects us to the Father. And the Godhead knows where we're at and what we're doing. And it leadeth us. The Holy Spirit of God leadeth us in the ways of righteousness that are set before us in God's Word. That we see Christ, and this is His Word. The Word was flesh. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh. The Word was God even before the foundation of the world. And Christ has shown us the Father. 
that in all these things that points us to God, who is the author and finisher of all things, even Christ being the author and finisher of our faith, who has saved us by his power, and by that Spirit of the Lord, which dwells within us in that Holy Spirit, we find that we are to submit ourselves unto God, not submit ourselves unto the flesh, to be instruments of unrighteousness. But he said, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Most sins are outward. They're outward actions, which can be seen and heard, but they start again in the mind. Thoughts of desire that come from the inward action or the inward thoughts and the heart being behind all that, that heart which is deceitfully wicked, which makes us think upon and desire things and desire to be a part of things in a way that, is not, that does not glorify God. Whether it be the desire from the heart that causes us to begin to desire and lust after the food, the meats even, that we might feast upon them and satisfy the hunger that's within us to eat and eat and eat. Well, I like a good steak just as well as anyone else, but I know that the blood has to be cooked out of it. It can't be still half, or some say uh, when it's still kicking. My friends, it's sin. It's sin to eat the meat with the blood still running out of it. It's sin to eat the blood. The blood has to be drained out. It has to be cooked out. It has to be well cooked. At least to be seen. Whether it be meat, whether it be other foods, if we eat in abundance, it's gluttony. We overeat. It's bad for our bodies, bad for our health. We don't take care of ourselves. Our body is the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit which dwells within us. And this temple we ought to take care of. Our bodies, we ought to take care of it as saints of God. We ought to take care of our bodies. But well, we only have one in this life. And if we don't take care of this body, we won't be here as long as we could be. We'll find physical health declines and then eventually we die. But there is that type of sin, that, and to say of these sins being outwardly, there are many sins that are just actions of anger, and lust, greed, all those sin, and all sin in the sense of deadly. Let's see, think of the seven deadly sins, or all sins are deadly. All, all sin leads to death. But through Christ we have life. And whether it be sin or the way we eat, the way we think, are the sin of action with others. So, I mean, uh, most sins are just a thing which you yourself do by yourself. But fornication is something you do with someone else. But the desire to be a part of that starts in the heart and the mind. And inwardly we sin because we've desired to be with someone in that way who is not our spouse before we're married. And if we be married and have desires toward another coming from the heart, then it's adultery. And if we yield ourselves unto that, it's adultery. These things, again, as he said, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. That sin, it's on the outside, and since it's visible to those round about you, they can see what you're taking part in. But that sin and action where two come together in sin, it affects the body. Your body, her body. Both of you. Two people. Each person interacting and taking part is sinning against themselves and against God. Say so what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Do we not understand this, that as children of God, as those who profess to be believers that are saved by the grace of God, do we not understand that that Holy Spirit of God dwells within us, 
that we being saved by the grace of God, it dwells within us, and it is the Holy Spirit of God that gives us understanding of the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit of God that our actions quench because the heart being deceitful begins to make us think upon wicked things and desire wickedness, and we begin to quench that voice of the Spirit of God that's saying, no, this is what the Lord says. This is what God's Word says. This is how you ought to be thinking and desiring. This is how you ought to outwardly act. And our inward man and the desires of flesh beginning to push us in the wrong direction. We begin to yield to it. We begin to put it into action. And we quench the Holy Spirit more as we enter into that action and we be a part of that action, which is sin. But yet the Holy Spirit is still there. It's still there. And the proof of it being that if we are then chastened, we know that we are sons. If there's that conscience and it starts in a sense with a conscience and inwardly we begin to realize within that we've done something we shouldn't have done. We've been part of something we shouldn't have been a part of. We acted in a way that we shouldn't have acted. It is that Holy Spirit reminding us, pricking our hearts, and bringing us into the understanding that we have done wrong, we've been in the wrong, and that we ought to repent and turn from it, even as we've repented before. That's power and working the Holy Spirit of God within us, because it is inside of us. This body, my body, is a temple of that Holy Spirit, and so is yours if you're saved by the grace of God. It dwells within you. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Being saved does not give us liberty to live however we want. Salvation is not a license to sin. It's not a license to just go out here and to yield ourselves into anything and any action and do whatever so ever we desire to do in the flesh. But that Holy Spirit does not lead us that way. It leads us in the ways of God. And the more that we then dwell here in the Word of God and read and study here, it will open it up to us, giving us understanding, showing us that old sinful man that we are, that we might be humble, that we might understand and acknowledge God is the one who saves us. An old wretched man that I am, even as Paul said, there is nothing good that dwells within me. But it is God that saves. It is God that justifies. It is God that's called us under faith and repentance. And that Holy Spirit that abides within us leads us unto all truth. Understanding's not of this flesh. We go and we get education in our lifetime. Go through uh, different levels of education. Some farther than others. But if we're not careful... We can begin to lean on our own flesh. Begin to think, well, I've educated myself to the point where I can understand and know all things. Not in this life. Not even in the life to come will we ever know all things. But we understand what little we have been by the grace of God allowed to see and understand. But yet we can't understand more if we would but yield and lean upon the Holy Spirit of God that it might open up to us the scriptures. All oh, some are blind and they think, oh, if I can just get a Bible that's wrote in a more simpler way of reading and understanding, I might understand it more fully. No. For after it's watered down and pen knife, or pen knifed, you have less there that is truth or in truth the Word of God. The King James Bible in our English language is the Word of God without error. It exists in other languages also. It's not the only language the Word of God's in. And not just the Greek and the Hebrew, Latin, those old Germanic languages in Europe that it came forth in, those old peoples of the days of old before uh, King James ever come along, before those men ever set into action to bring about this book. The Word of God was out there. They had the Word of God in their languages. And still many have it in their languages. It's been translated into their languages. 
Yes, that's a part of what God had decreed to come to pass. Some ignorantly believe because I or any other would hold the King James Bible as the Word of God. That we believe it's the only Word of God. Well, they make fools themselves by thinking and acting so and making such accusations against God's people. For it is not the only word of God, but it is the word of God unto me. And I know and understand it by faith, and I know that there are wicked and ungodly men, of whom many are called scholars, who do not believe the word of God. They do not believe these things, and it's because the Holy Spirit of God is not in them, is not leading them, they are religious men, ungodly men, who have yielded themselves unto that sin, which is to deny the word of God and not to believe it. And go beyond that even to where they want to lead others away from it, unto that which they have put their money in, and their life into, exalting something else other than the very word of God itself. That Holy Spirit, if it dwells within them, they're going to believe the word of God. They're going to understand this word. And there's something wrong today with the churches of the Lord who in this day and time don't want to take and expound these scriptures and teach the people. Brethren, we're to teach the people the word of God. So, oh, but don't you know there's these archaic words there? There's these names of things in here that uh, are just not commonplace anymore. Don't you understand this? Don't you understand it's your responsibility to teach the people what thus saith the Lord? You pastors, you churches, it's the responsibility of the churches and the pastors in those churches to teach us the word of God, and that's the leadership of the Holy Spirit to lead us in those things in the counsel of God. We're not our own. Just as we are not to yield ourselves unto these other types of sin, we ought not yield ourselves unto doubting and casting doubt on the word of God. For the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Our body is the temple of God. We're not our own. My friends, we've been bought with a price. He says in verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So which one? The body and the spirit? Both of them. My body is the Lord's. My spirit is the Lord's. They're God's. And I'm to yield myself unto him. Save by the grace of God after hearing the preaching of the word of God. Following the Lord and yielding myself unto baptism. Becoming a member of a true, local, visible church of baptized believers. And there being taught the things of God. Over many years, many teachers and preachers, pastors, setting before me the things of God, which God now also calling me to do likewise, to set before the masses of this world, the those that are lost, those that are saved, to preach unto you the gospel, to teach and preach unto you all the all things of God, that you might trust in God and in his word, that you not doubt it. It's all that I have a hard time understanding it. Yes, there are many things here and hard to understand. Even Simon Peter himself spoke that. But that does not give us license or liberty to depart from this book and to rewrite it, to go to another book that supposedly is more simple, more easier to understand. That's not to trust in the Holy Spirit of God to lead me into all things. I've been bought with a price. I don't have a, the, it's a sin for me to yield myself unto gluttony. It's a sin for me to yield myself unto lying or any of those sins. He spoke of idolatry, being infeminate, being an abuser of myself, being a thief, being covetous, being a drunkard, being a reveler, being an extortioner. All those things which are sin, I have not the liberty to yield myself unto, and neither do I have liberty to depart from the word of God and use the words of men to try to lead you in the paths of righteousness. For we are all, my friends, that are saved, all of us that are saved, we've been bought with a price, 
We're not our own. We're called to serve the Lord and not to glorify Him and to be obedient unto His Word and to believe in it and not to cast it aside for something else that's been has its roots out of Egypt, that has its roots in the hearts and minds of men that denied Christ, that denied His works, His miracles, denied His resurrection, denied Him as the Son of God. But yet that's what many are yielding themselves unto. Satan's Bibles are so closely a mimic of the true Word of God that it would be easy for us to be deceived and led astray into those things. But my friends, we've been bought with a price. We ought not yield ourselves to be led by others away from the foundation of the Word of God that has been given unto us, that hereby we might know how we ought to live, how we ought to act, how we ought not yield ourselves unto wickedness. And it is a sin to doubt God's work. It is a sin to try to divide God's people and to lead them away from the Word of God. We ought to keep this. We ought to live by this, not for salvation. We don't, we're not uh, to be, faithfulness is not a requirement for salvation. It's a fruit of it. If you're saved by the grace of God, you're going to have works that show forth salvation in your life. Someone who professes salvation but has no evidence of outward fruit. It's just like that tree the Lord went to. He went to it with an anticipation to find fruit on it. It was a season. Fruit should have, well, out of season, in season, it doesn't matter. He went to it with anticipation that there would be fruit there, and there wasn't. We're to be ready in season and out to give an answer. And he asks of us the hope that's within us. Can you do that, my friend? If someone comes nigh unto you and says, Hey, do you believe in the Lord? Are you trusting in the Lord? You ought to be able to tell them about it. It's like you know, that dear, that brother that some time ago that I spoke to over the internet. And he ignored my desires. He wanted to look down upon me because of a name, I think. Because of the title Sovereign in our title. One to associate to that something he didn't believe in. Well, I'd say to you, this is what I mean, and I've said it before by sovereign. I mean that Jesus is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, is the only blessed potentate, and he is my sovereign. And if you're saved by the grace of God, he's your sovereign too. And you ought to acknowledge him as such. He is my sovereign Lord, Savior, King, Lord of glory, and he is my Savior. In him there is no other whereby I must be saved but in through Jesus Christ. And it is his word, his doctrine, which we are taught from and which we teach from. Herein is what God, through the preaching of this word of God, is how I was saved. The English preaching of the word of God, this English language. I, I speak, and it, it is the language of my birth. I was taught English. And from this Bible, the English Bible, the King James Bible, is the foundation of my faith. Because here it is what I've been taught and learned of my Lord and my Savior. And I know that I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. And if you're the Lord's, neither are you. You're not your own. And you ought to glorify God in all that you say and do. Don't refuse or turn away from the opportunity to glorify God when you can. For even in that, it's sin if you don't do what you know you ought to do. May God keep